with me as we read the word this morning. So a couple pieces of scripture to season our minds as we begin today. So Psalm 139 says something kind of amazing. King David uh, prayed this prayer. It's in verses 23 and 24. It says, search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there's any offensive way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. Luke chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, speaking of the ministry of John the Baptist, it says, he will bring my people, he will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people, I like this, Prepared for the Lord. Preparing people for the Lord. Father, we love you this morning. We thank you this morning. It's a good day to be alive. God, we're, we are so blessed in this room, God. Today is a beautiful day that you've made, and we rejoice in this day, and we're grateful for this day. And Lord, we choose to come and worship you this morning because you're worthy of our worship. We come, Lord, to grow and to learn at your feet. We ask, Lord Jesus, that you would send your spirit upon us this morning, that you would touch our ears, that we might hear the voice of God today, that you touch our eyes, that we could see the Lord Jesus and see you, God, in our midst. So, Lord, we just commit this time to you now. We pray this now in the name of the Lord Jesus. And all those who love Jesus would say what? Amen. Amen. So, uh, before, uh, so, real quick, Pastor Graham, where is Pastor Graham? Where are you? So, so Pastor Graham's 80th birthday is today. And he doesn't look it, does he? So what are we supposed to do when it's somebody's birthday? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor Graham. Happy birthday to you. So, and, and we always say cha-cha-cha, right? Cha-cha-cha. Pastor Graham loves cha-cha-cha. He learned, so you may be seated. Welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're here this morning. Welcome to Woodbridge Community Church. And as you've probably heard the rumor, it's beginning to look a lot like Christmas, right? Um, in, uh, obviously, so praise God for everybody. On Tuesday last week, an army, a small army came and began preparing the church for as it looks now, which is so beautiful. As, as we're preparing the church uh, for Christmas, the Christmas uh, tree lighting last night was awesome. The Christmas concert was awesome. The Christmas party was awesome. We had an amazing night. Um, for all of us, we're preparing for Christmas, aren't we? Have you pre- how, how's your house look? Does your house... Are, how many people actually have their Christmas lights up? Raise your hand. Wow. Okay, okay. So for us, right now, we're in the process of putting it together and kind of coming together. Um, there's a battle that goes on about this time of year. Fake or real Christmas tree? Okay, so all those who say real Christmas tree, raise your hand. There they are. There they are. So that's my son, Jeremiah. My, it doesn't count, Dad, if we don't get a real one. Ah, how many people say fake? Raise your hand. There they are. There they are. Why? Well, fake is more, uh, it's, they're easier to put up. Uh, they don't make as much mess, right? Um, they're cheaper if you buy one and just keep reusing it over and over again, right? Right? Ah, but the argument of the real, it's just it, the smell, right? So in our home, uh, we've compromised. So in one room, we have the real one. And we have to get the Douglas fir because it smells better. And that's a whole other battle between Noble and Douglas. Behold, Christmas is coming, right? So we have the f- real one in one room and the fake one in the other. And so, you know, we're, we're in the process of getting our home together and putting up Christmas lights. I got to do this this week. And for Pastor Frank, I'm a rebel. Um, we put a nativity in, our, in, our, uh, in front of our house. I think I took it last night. I don't know if you guys saw this picture, but 
We, have a, we, we, we slap a nativity up there. Did you guys get that one? Did you see that? I don't know if you got it or not. If you come over to our house, we have a Mary and Joseph nativity all set up. And they're hard to find. Have you noticed? Santa's everywhere. Frosty the snowman's everywhere. We actually put up uh, a nativity for us. So anyway, that's kind of where we're at. So you know why? Because it's all about Jesus. That's why. Amen. So how about you? Are you preparing for Christmas? Is your heart looking for Christmas? Um, Your house is getting uh, more looking like Christmas. The church is looking more like Christmas. As we're preparing for Christmas, people, how, here's the question for us this morning. Externally, we're doing so many things, okay, to prepare our hearts for Christmas. What about the inside, internally? Question, how do you prepare yourself inside your heart for Jesus? How do you prepare your hearts for Christ? And if Jesus is the reason of the season, then maybe the better question is, is how do we prepare our hearts for Jesus this Christmas season? Isn't that a, is that a great question? So, you know, when we study Christmas, the coming of Jesus, and when we, be, when we read the story of the Messiah coming, it's, it's not about um, one birth, but two. When you open the pages of the Bible and you read Happy Birthday to Jesus, you'll find that it's not just one birth, but it's two, right? Back to back. See, before Jesus' birth, another baby was born to a very elderly couple that was never able to have kids. Uh, The birth of this baby was to the priest Zechariah and to his wife Elizabeth, and they were both of the priestly tribe of Aaron. And... Basically, it goes like this. Zechariah is uh, at the temple because he's a priest. And he enters the holy place in the temple in Jerusalem. And he's there to burn incense, which is like a big deal. He had to go through all these purifications and these cleansings in order to go into the holy place of God. And as he's there performing this ritual, this religious ritual, do you guys know what happens to him? Gabriel shows up, an angel shows up. It goes like this. Luke chapter 1, verse 11 through 17. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. Hello, right? When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. And so would you if you meet an angel. Especially Gabriel. He's a fiery one. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. And he will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he's born. So this, he's anointed from in the womb, right? He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God. That means that they're separated from him, right? And he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and in the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous. And here it is, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Isn't that good? People, when we, when we open the pages of the Bible, and I hope that you're going to do that this Christmas, and read again the Christmas stories, when you look closely at the background, when you squint into the shadows of the incredible virgin birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, we'll see that in the distance, there's another amazing birth that God has given to the earth. It's not as amazing as Jesus, and nor is he as amazing as Jesus, but he's still miraculous. And this individual is very important. Check this out. One miraculous birth precedes another. And the birth of the one prepares the way of the other. The birth of this one, job description, is to prepare for this one's coming. 
If you're going to take notes with me this morning, this is a, a good note to write down. Write this down in your notes with me. Ready? The mission of John the Baptist was to prepare humanity for the coming of Jesus. Isn't that good? His job is to prepare the way of the Lord. To pre- prepare not just people back then, but let me say this. Do you know that John's ministry is to prepare you this Christmas for the coming of Jesus? We're going to do many external things between now and December the 25th. We're going to go shopping. We're going to uh, put up Christmas trees, Christmas lights. We're going to, uh, you know, all these external. But internally, if you are going to internally prepare your heart for Christ, you have to hang out with John the Baptist. We all do. Because his job description is to prepare us for the Lord, right? Right? So people, this morning I want to give you a slice of John the Baptist this morning, right? Uh, See, here's the deal. Both the baby Jesus and John the Baptist, the God's purposes is that these little babies would grow up and become men and that they would do the job that God had for them to do. And that's what happened. John the Baptist grew up. This is what it says about him. So I just want you to, I'm just going to read this and I want you just to, Tell me, is this the kind of guy you would want to invite to your Christmas party? Okay? So here it comes. Matthew chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. It says, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and saying, here it is, repent, for the kingdom of heaven's at hand. or It's near, right? This is the one who was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. A voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare the way for the Lord. Make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair. And he had a leather belt around his waist. And his food was locusts and wild honey. Anyone? Is that, is that what you're looking forward to? People went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan and they were confessing their sins and they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. So far so good, right? But when many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Produce fruit in keeping with your repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe, and, huh, here, the axe is already at the root of the tree. Every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance. But after me comes one who is more powerful than I, whose sandals I'm not worthy to carry. And he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn, but burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Isn't that nice? What do you think of John, people? What do you think? Is this kind of guy you want to invite to your Christmas party? He's, a, he's kind of a, hermer, a, a hermit. He's, he's a loner, right? Uh, he's probably not a lot of fun to hang out with. Probably wouldn't be the life of the party. He's very serious. He appears to be quite angry or intense, right? And by the way, he's out of fashion. <laughs> with his dress and his diet. So people ask, what's the deal with the dress, Pastor Frank? Great question, right? So if you look in Matthew chapter 3, if you go back 400 years, the last book of the Old Testament was called Malachi. And in Malachi, there's all these prophecies of John the Baptist. John the Baptist isn't just found uh, in Isaiah. There's prophecies of the coming one all over the pages of the Old Testament. The prophecies of Messiah coming, but right before Messiah's coming, there's prophecies of one coming preparing the way for the Messiah. And it it says that this guy will be in the spirit of Elijah, who was one of the most powerful prophets of the Old Testament. Um, This guy is wearing Elijah's clothes. This guy is eating Elijah's food. It's like he's wearing 400-year-old dress. 
It'd be like some person, let's say in America there's some prophecy that somebody's coming and some guy in a colonial wig shows up and starts dressing 200 years ago like like George Washington. You're like, you just stick out. John the Baptist, when he came, see, the people are already waiting for Messiah. They know that somebody has to prepare the way. And here he is. He's wearing Elijah's clothes. He's eating, Eli- he's eating the food of the prophets. And as John is, is doing this, and he's actually hanging out where Elijah hung out, out in the wilderness, people took notice. People took notice. As people went out to him, he began preaching, repent. Take notes of me this morning. Here it is. Ready? Note number two. John's message was a call of reflection, of confession, and repentance. John's message is people came out, and this guy had, I mean, there's something about him. He had the spirit of God on him. People went out to the Jordan River to hear him. And his message was to all people, it's time for you to look inside It's time for personal reflection. And if there's anything in there that's not right, it's time of confession. And it's time to repent. And repentance is not just merely an intellectual exercise of, yeah, what I'm doing is wrong. But repentance is involved with doing something about it because you know what you're doing is wrong. It's doing a 180. And and from repentance comes fruits or a changed life, right? Right? Um, this was John's message. Keep fruit with your repentance. So, and, and as people were doing this, there was an inner spiritual cleansing taking place in their lives. Okay? And somehow doing this prepares them for Jesus. So there is an element. The, the first element of John's message is, is reflection and confession and repentance. Here, there's another part. Write this down. Note number three. Write this one. John's message was a warning that the Lord was on his way. The Lord is on his way. So as he's preaching, you guys need to do this. Why? Because the Lord is right around the corner. The Lord is on his way. And when the Lord comes, he's not messing around. Right? Right? The king is in the land. People, if you knew that Jesus was coming back tomorrow, would you live differently today? John's message is you should live like that every day. Because we don't know when the Lord's coming. But you're going to stand before him. It's, it's John's message, when you look at it, it's like there's an intensity in his voice. There is an emotion. There's a passion in his voice. God is coming, get real. Quit messing around. Quit playing religious games. It's a message of urgency. Every time I I read this and I listen to John, there was a time when I had my youngest son, Jeremiah, was um, we had gotten him a bicycle and he's still on his tri. You remember those? Like it's not like the bike where he had the little tri, the training wheels. And there was a day when I was in the, in the front yard of our house and we had our van parked out in front of our house. My little boy was, uh, was riding down our driveway and a car was speeding by. And I could see that and I saw my little boy and I wish you could have heard the urgency in my voice when I screamed at the top of my lungs, Jeremiah, stop! And he hit his brakes. He could hear it. If he hadn't have done that, he would have been hit. And I wanted to chase that guy down that was speeding down our street. <laughs> when I read John, I hear that urgency in his voice. Don't you? Don't you? Stop it. God's around the corner. It's time to get real with God. It's time to get serious with God. 
This was John's message. And it was, and, and this is so cool, when you're listening to John, who was his message to? Who was his message to? Matthew chapter 3, verse 5 and 6 says, People went out to him from Jerusalem in all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan, confessing their sins. They were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Who was John's message to? People who lives in Jerusalem. What's in Jerusalem? The temple, the holy temple of God. The priests, the high priests, the religious center of Judaism is in Jerusalem and Judea and the Jordan. John's message was to religious people. Write this one down. Note number four. John's message was to religious people. These people had knowledge of God. Uh, They were devoted in rituals of worshiping God. Uh, going to synagogue every Saturday, uh, uh, devoted to the rituals, the temple rituals in Jerusalem. These people were religious people. And what's so amazing, and yet as they're doing all this external stuff, inside they knew something wasn't right. Does that ever happen to you? Just something's not right. You just know in your heart there's something between you and God that's just not right. And in, so in the midst of all the religious rituals, John's out there in the Jordan and people are coming by the thousands. And they're actually being baptized. They're coming and confessing their sins. They're doing reflection and saying, man, I'm playing games with God. He, his message was to religious people. To religious people. And check this out, not only to religious people. So what's so cool, when you read in Malachi, uh, the last book of the Old Testament, so it's kind of cool. If you read your Bible, you've got the Old Testament, then you've got 400 years of silence, and then the New Testament. So the last prophet of the Old Testament is Malachi. And, and as God's speaking through Malachi, he says, John the Baptist is coming, John the Baptist is coming, John the Baptist is coming, one preparing the way of the Lord. The Lord's coming, and one's coming before him. And it's kind of cool, when you read Malachi chapter 3, It says that Malachi will, the prophet that's coming, John the Baptist, will purify the priests. That his message isn't just to the religious people, his message is to the religious leaders of the day. And it's so cool because it totally happened. As John's preaching, all these religious people are coming out, and the priests are coming out. In verse 7 through 9, it says, but when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees, even the religious leaders are coming out. He was saying, uh, being baptized, he said to them, I love this, you brood of vipers. That's really nice. Who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Produce fruit in keeping with your repentance. Don't think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up Abraham. His message was to the religious leaders of the day as well. Write that down. John's message, he's speaking, man, and this is God's prophet. He's speaking to the people that are religious, but they know something's not right. And he's speaking to the religious leaders. You guys better pull it together because the Lord's coming. Have you read in the Bible that um, people who teach the Bible are held to a stricter judgment? Have you heard that? Should that scare me? Darn right. I'm going, to, I'm going to stand before the Lord and give an account of my life. And according to the Bible, I'm going to be held to a stricter accountability because I'm a leader. I'm a pastor. Back then, same thing. And he's purifying them. Telling these guys, you better change. And it's kind of cool. He's, his message to them is, don't use your religious background as an excuse to not being real with God. Don't say, well, I'm a child of Abraham. I don't need to repent of my sins. Check this out. That isn't going to fly. It's kind of like today saying, I was raised in a Christian home. I was infant baptized with holy water. I don't need to do anything else. That's baloney. Baloney. That's not going to fly. You don't hold to some religious tradition saying, I did this, so now I can just be whoever I... That won't fly, people. You can't live like the devil all week and then come to church on Sunday and say, yay, God says that ain't going to work. That's John's message. That's John's message. 
It's, there's an authenticity to it. He comes to prepare the way of the Lord. And his message is, quit playing games with God. Get real with the Lord. It's time to be open and honest with God. It's time to be authentic with the Lord. And how was his message received? Pretty well. Massive um, turnaround in people's hearts. They were being baptized. In the, they, they, the Jewish people, in their mindset, if a Gentile wanted to begin to become a worshiper of the Hebrew God, they needed to get water baptized. But these Jewish people were so broken and humble, they're going, I need to get baptized. They were confessing their sins at the Jordan River. And by doing this, people, this was preparing their hearts for Jesus. See, religion without Jesus is empty. It's like a honeymoon without a spouse is empty. Religion, religious rituals without Jesus is empty. Just like going on a honeymoon without your spouse. It's just not right, people. You need Jesus. Jesus is the center of it all. Write this down. Note number six. The spiritual discipline of authenticity and confession and repentance prepares the way of Jesus in our hearts. Here's a spiritual truth. Just as physical laws, I could drop a pen. The law of gravity is just a law. Here's a spiritual law. Authenticity and confession and repentance prepares the way of Jesus in our lives. And people who learn to do this in their own spiritual formation, in their own spiritual journey, are people who've experienced real life change in their relationship with Jesus. And these are the people that experience the power of the Holy Spirit in their lives. They're walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. They're not quenching God's Spirit. They're not grieving God's Spirit. These are people that just, the people that learn this spiritual law are people that have an inner walk with Christ. Two weeks ago, I, at Thanksgiving, I, I talked about the spiritual discipline of being thankful, uh, being grateful before God for his provident blessing that is in your life. And that's a spiritual discipline we all have to learn, to always be thankful and look at the beautiful things that God has done in our life. And if you do that, it'll change your attitude. Just learning to be grateful and thankful for what you have. It's a spiritual discipline. Last Sunday, I talked about the spiritual discipline of hitting the brakes, and Jesus was so good at this. Jesus was so good at hitting the brakes and being able to stay in balance in life and spending quality time with the Lord because it's so critical. Jesus would spend such killer time with God the Father. He, would, he wasn't a person that was consumed by the world, but he had ways of stopping the world and, and having good time with the Lord. And for those of us, we need to learn that in our lives. Here's another spiritual discipline. When you're spending time alone with God, when you're spending that time of thanksgiving, a time of just reflection, for you to be able to sit in the presence of God and say, God, is there anything in my life that's just not right? Authenticity. Is there anything, Lord, in my life that, that's unpleasing to you? Is there? This spiritual discipline prepares the way of Jesus. It prepared the way of Jesus 2,000 years ago. It prepares the way of Jesus now. Huh. The most dangerous prayer, one of the most dangerous prayers you could pray is Psalm 139. Verses 23 and 24. King David prayed this prayer. Man after God's own heart. I want to tell you, the most, one of the most dangerous prayers you could pray is Psalm 139. It goes like this. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. That is a dangerous prayer to pray. People that are brave enough to sit with God 
and pray this prayer are willing to let God speak into your life about anything. You're drinking. How you treat people. How you treat your spouse. Gossiping. Slandering people. Stealing. Lying. This is a really dangerous prayer to pray. Because in it you're saying, God, here's my life. What do you see? People that pray prayers like this have crossed a line in their spiritual faith with God. See, the Holy Spirit comes to bring us a confession of sin, righteousness, judgment. If you do stuff like this, and you begin sitting with the Lord and saying, God, is there anything in my life that's not right? God's going to talk to you. And when God speaks to you, what should you do? Argue with him. Tell him he's wrong. Tell him, justify it. Well, Lord, totally push back. Tell him he's not seeing it right. Or even better, tell him that's none of your business. Good luck. There are people, when God starts bringing stuff up, don't fight with him, but agree with him. Confession means you're right. Confess your sin and repent. It's a 180. God, I agree with you. I'm wrong. Will you please help me change? Right? Lord, I love you. You're right. I'm treating my spouse horribly. God, I'm sorry. Will you forgive me? Help me to love her better. Help me to do better. When God starts bringing this stuff up, don't fight with him. Agree with him because he sees it clearly. Here's a beautiful, I put put this definition in your notes. Here's a beautiful definition. Confession is the point when my mouth gives voice to what my heart knows to be true about my sin. No matter what the reason or cause, and without excuse, genuine confession and repentance allows the soul to be most receptive to the abundant divine forgiveness. It's a spiritual law. That's good, people. Here's a quote. To confess your sins to God is not telling him anything he doesn't already know. But until you confess them, however, they are the abyss between you. But when you confess them, they become the Golden Gate Bridge. See, your sin separates you from God. Your sin separates you from God. Have you ever seen a marriage that's just not good? You go out with a couple, and they're not talking. They're married, but they're just not talking. You ever seen a Christian whose walk with God is just not doing very well? Their relationship between his father is strained. Have you ever seen this? You ever happened to you? It's happened to me. Confession is that time when you're in examination and he's mad. He's like, Frankie, you can't be treating Cinda that way. That's my daughter. How dare you? Yes, Lord. You need to stop. I love you too, but you can't do that. Yes, Lord. Right? I agree. I confess. I'm going to change. People, I pray this often as your pastor. I pray this often as your pastor. Is that a good thing? I pray a Psalm 139 all the time. Lord, is there any wicked way in me? Is there anything in my life that's not right? I do this a lot as a pastor. Is that a good thing? It's really good, people. See, I need to be a godly man. This church needs a godly man as a pastor. My wife needs a godly man as her husband. My kids needs a godly man as their father. My neighbors need a godly man as their neighbor. I pray this all the time because I need to be changed. And I'm very... 
God, I'm, uh, Lord, is there anything in my life? Is there anything in my life? When I, so it's so cool. Have you guys heard of the great reformer Martin Luther? Martin Luther, the great reformer of the Protestant Reformation. He would link the Psalm 139 prayer and he would begin looking at the Ten Commandments. He wouldn't just pray, God, is there any wicked way within me? And then he would begin examining himself. He would grab the teachings of Moses. Thou shalt have no other God before me. God, is, am I worshiping anything else but you, right? Thou shalt not lie. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou, and you start walking through to Ten Commandments, take Jesus with you and go walk through the Ten Commandments. See what he says to you. Or the seven deadly sins of pride, anger, lust, envy, greed, laziness, or gluttony. Examine yourself. God, how am I doing? You talk to God about these things. It's a spiritual discipline. Are, is your heart prepared for Christmas? Is your heart prepared for Jesus? Did you know that 2,000 years ago, this prepared people for the coming of Christ? And John did a great job. Do you know that the Bible says, if, if you don't know Jesus and you want to accept Christ, you have to go through this. How can you accept Christ of your sins if you don't confess your sins? Do you understand? Like, this prayer is really good for people that are coming to know Jesus. Is this a good prayer to pray for people that already know Jesus? Answer? Yes. yes. Do you know in 1 John 1.19 it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and, and righteous to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us for all unrighteousness. This was written to believers. It's called progressive sanctification first, positional sanctification. Positional sanctification is when you accept Christ in your life, you are positionally a child of God. Can you ever do anything to not be, can your kid ever do something to not be your kid anymore? And answer, no, they're your kid. But can you ever be mad at your kid? Do you know that we can be God's child and yet there's still stuff in our lives where God's going, I'm really not happy with that in your life. And because I love you so much, you don't need that in your life. It's, it's, this is a good prayer to pray in our, in our progressive sanctification as we're growing to become more godly. It's, it's a dangerous prayer, people. But if you want to prepare your hearts for Christmas this year, you know what you need to do? You need to pray Psalm 139. Externally, you're going to do all this stuff for Christmas. Internally, are you preparing for Christmas? You really want to have a, a, a connection with Jesus this Christmas? Lord, is there anything in my life that's just not right before you? Lord, search me and try me. Know my anxious thoughts. Test me. Is there anything in my life that's offensive, that's not right, God? Lead me in the way everlasting. Dangerous prayer. But you should all do it because it prepares the way of Jesus moving in your life. Does that make sense? See, authenticity is what God wants. Don't play games. Be real with me. Here's, can I tell you something? There's a lot of people that are afraid to go into the inner sanctum with Jesus because they're afraid that he's going to scream at him and yell at them. I have a lot of friends of mine that are like, I don't want to go in there because I already know what my sin is and I don't want to go in. I don't want to go in that inner chamber with him because I think he's going to beat me up. Jesus says, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble at heart, and I will provide rest for your soul. Can I tell you something? That is Christ. Every time I go to the Lord, he never smacks me upside the head. He lovingly looks at me and speaks into my life. He is the good shepherd. He is not somebody to be afraid of in that respect. Respected, yes. Do you know that Jesus is gentle? And he's humble? 
And yet he's the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He's the captain of the hosts of heaven. He is mighty and powerful and people tremble at his feet. And yet his heart, he's gentle and humble at heart. He will judge the world. He is coming, people. We should be preparing our hearts for Christ. I want to close in a prayer. And as I pray, my brother Ferdinand's going to come up and he's going to sing a song for you that speaks to this. Father, I lift up my brothers and my sisters in this room. Lord Jesus, Merry Christmas. We love this time of the year. It is the most wonderful time of the year. And it is the busiest time of the year. It's an awesome time of the year. God, for those of us in this room, we're so blessed because we know the meaning of Christmas. We understand that God is real and God sent his son into our lives. We're so blessed, Lord, because we understand that this Jesus came to save us from our sins and to restore us to the Father. He came to bring us new life, abundant life, a peace that this world will never give, a joy that this world will never give, an eternal destiny that is sealed in Christ for us. Lord, we have nothing to be afraid of in Messiah. And Jesus, as you come into our lives, you recognize, Lord, that it's a relationship. And Lord, just as we want people to be real with us, You want us to be real with you. Jesus, just as we don't want people in our lives that are fake, you don't want us to be fake with you, to be open and authentic and real before you. Thank you, God, that you are so mighty and so loving that you are intimately acquainted with all of our ways. God, you even know us better than we know ourselves. You are our counselor the wonderful counselor, the great I am. God, I pray that you would help us in this room today to learn how to be more authentic and real with you. Teach us, Lord, to pray brave prayers of allowing you into our lives. We pray this for the glory of the kingdom of Jesus. And all those who love Jesus would say, Amen. Amen. Welcome.